I'm back guys. Sorry it's been a while. I hope you haven't missed me too much. But today I'm going to be getting right back into it by telling you how you can plan to take a large amount of income in retirement and pay little to no tax at all. It might sound far-fetched, but it is doable and I'm going to show you how. I have done a similar video in the past, but things have changed and we need to update it. I'm going to give you some examples of how you can maximise various little known allowances when you take gains from certain investments and just how big a difference that can make to you in terms of how much money you keep. One of the reasons I haven't posted in a while is because I've been completing work on my cash flow modelling courses, which I'm pleased to say are now live and they give you access to all of the fantastic tools I'll be using in this video. So check that out in the description below. If you've landed here for the first time, I'm Chris Bourne. I'm a financial planner based here in the UK and for the best part of 20 years now I've been helping people achieve tax efficient financial independence. That's what we talk about on this channel, today's no different, so let's get into it. Now when it comes to contribution allowances to tax efficient investment accounts we're actually quite spoilt in the UK compared to other parts of the developed world and we may not realise that. The problem is that the system is designed in such a way that the people who are most able to take advantage of it aren't allowed to particularly when it comes to pension contributions. Some of my clients have this problem, if you can call it that, where they might be earning four, 500 grand a year and the most they can put into a pension is 10,000. At that level of earnings, they're generally used to a certain lifestyle and only being able to pay that amount into a pension every year for the rest of their working lives probably doesn't even equate to a single year's worth of income. In many cases, they can't even put the overspill into their partner's pension because they may be earning too little. As a maximum, you can only contribute up to your gross level of earnings or £60,000, whichever is higher. So although we now have this £60,000 annual allowance, in theory, the number of people who've got both the permission and the capacity to make that level of contribution year in, year out, is quite small and the government know it. My clients who are company owners tend to have the greatest flexibility because they can choose how much they pay themselves and allow their companies to then make large pension contributions. If you're successful, you are still definitely rewarded for taking that plunge of becoming a business owner. Similarly, I've got many other clients who really start to hit their stride earnings-wise in the latter years of their careers, and there just simply isn't the time to fill tax-efficient pots like ISAs, which have a £20,000 annual contribution restriction, and pensions up to reasonable levels. Other clients might receive large equity payouts or inheritances, and the question becomes, where can I put this money that will give me reasonable potential for growth and be tax efficient? I don't know, Jeff. Now, I spend a lot of time planning these sorts of situations with clients, and there is a methodology we can use. Fortunately, it doesn't require us to memorise all of the various tax reliefs in the UK taxation system, of which there are over 1,100. It starts with having an understanding of what's called the order of taxation which is very important because it enables to structure our investments now to take the gains out in a very specific way in the future and avoid paying tax. So I've covered this before, but to recap on that order of taxation, here's what you need to know. In any tax calculation, the first layer of income that's assessed is earned income. That includes salary and P11D benefits, self-employed earnings, pension income, and rental income. Next, you're taxed on savings income. Now that generally means interest, but it also includes gains on offshore investment bonds. We'll return to those a little later. After savings income, it's dividend income, followed by life policy gains, which includes gains on onshore bonds. And finally, capital gains, which basically catches everything else, including the capital growth you may get on general investment accounts. So after we know the order that income and growth is taxed in, we then need to know what allowances are available every year for us to maximise. We start with the personal allowance, which is generally well known to people and ensures that the first £12,570 of your income is taxed at 0%. That's an important distinction. The income isn't tax-free, it's taxed at 0%. Less well known than the personal allowance though is what's called the starter rate for savings band, which ensures that your first £5,000 of savings income i.e. interest, above that personal allowance is sheltered from tax too. The reason that not everybody knows about it is because you actually start to lose a pound of it for every one pound of earned income that you receive above 12,570. So it's completely lost at 17,570. 
An allowance that isn't lost though, unless you're an additional rate taxpayer, which means you earn more than £125,140 a year, is the personal savings allowance. This gives you a further £1,000 allowance for interest if you're a basic rate taxpayer, or £500 a year if you're in the higher rate band. The combination of those allowances means that you can receive your first £18,570 of income a year without any tax deducted in retirement, as long as it's taken from the right places. You then have the dividend allowance, which has taken a bit of a battering in recent times and currently allows you to receive the first £1,000 of dividends generated by your investment without tax deducted, assuming you're not already being paid dividends from elsewhere, such as your own company. Sadly, it will reduce next year to just £500. Finally, there's the capital gains tax allowance, which also more than halved for the 23-24 tax year to £6,000. This covers gains on really any investment that doesn't sit inside a specific tax wrapper, like an ISA, a pension or an investment bond. So gains on things like directly held shares or general investment accounts would be subject to capital gains tax. So armed with all of this knowledge, we can make a plan to place our investments in such a way that we utilize the tax system to our advantage. First of all though, let's see what the situation would be if we had all of our money in a pension. Here's a scenario showing a married couple, both currently age 55, who are planning to retire next year. They're targeting expenditure of 50K a year, which increases each year with inflation. Hence why the total expenditure figure is going up across the timeline. The primary vehicles for producing retirement income are pensions, but of the 1,050,000 held in pension plans, 1 million of it is in Billy's name, with just 50,000 in Millie's pot. This is actually quite a typical scenario that I see. So at the moment we can just see a blue chart which indicates to us that based on the growth and inflation assumptions used, the couple aren't expected to run out of money during their lifetimes and we've assumed they'll live until age 95. If a shortfall was expected, that would be shown on the chart in red. If I click this button that says details though, we can now see some new colours on the chart. And if I click legend here, we can see that those colours indicate income sources. So this orange colour is money purchase pensions, defined contribution pensions, which constitutes the sole source of income until state pensions kick in at age 67. So with a fair wind, the pot is projected to last for the lifetime of the clients. But we can see by looking at the assets chart that the pension pots shown in green here are expected to deplete over the timeline. So there's actually only just over 128 grand left at age 95. And if we look at the taxes chart, we can see that there's quite a lot of tax paid throughout the plan. A cumulative total of £403,000 in fact. Let's look at a different scenario then. What I'm going to show you now changes how the capital is held from it just being in a single pension pot to being split between other types of investments. So the same £1 million is split with £400,000 in Billy's pension, £100,000 each in stocks and shares ISAs, £300,000 in a jointly held offshore investment bond, and £50,000 each in general investment accounts. Now of those types of accounts, it's the offshore investment bond that you'll probably have the least working knowledge of. And I have created a video in the past that explains onshore and offshore bonds in more detail, which I've linked in the description below. But as I touched on earlier, the offshore bond will allow us to utilize the starter rate for savings band of £5,000 each, as well as the personal savings allowance of £1,000 each. So the way I've approached building this income is in stages, with the first phase running from retirement until age 67, when state pensions start. And instead of taking all of the required income from the pension, we take £16,760 from Billy's pension, comprising £12,570 taxable income, thereby using up his personal allowance and suffering no tax, and £4,190 of tax-free lump sum. No tax on that. We also take a withdrawal from Millie's pension, although not quite as large a withdrawal because the pot is much smaller and we want to try and make it last until at least age 67. We've therefore set the withdrawal amount to £6,666 a year, 
with 5,000 taxable withdrawal, but taxed at 0% within the personal allowance, and £1,666 tax-free lump sum. To give the pension a better chance of lasting, though, we move £2,880 a year into the pension from the GIA, which is made up to £3,600 with tax relief. £720 is added by HMRC, which is effectively 25% growth guaranteed. We also do the same into Billy's pension from his GIA. We then take a £12,000 withdrawal from the offshore bond, split 50-50, so £6,000 each, to utilise each of the starter rate savings bands and personal savings allowances, with any excess income taken from the ICES. Now we could actually take a little more from the bonds if we wanted to, because in reality, part of what is taken out could be treated as a return of capital, and on that basis, wouldn't be taxed anyway. But this is just to give us an idea. And here's how it looks. Well, we can see that the chart is still blue, so no shortfalls expected. But if we click on details now, we can see that the proportion of orange, indicating pension withdrawals, is now balanced by planned withdrawals from the bond and withdrawals from the ICES. The real difference, though, is what that does to the projected tax paid. If we go to a comparison view and change this to the taxes chart, instead of paying thousands of pounds a year in tax like we are in the base plan at the bottom, we're paying pretty much no tax at all. In fact, if we hover over age 67, we can see that the cumulative taxes paid at that point are projected to be £107,000 in the base plan, compared to just £31,000 in the new scenario. The vast majority of which is paid in the first year while the couple is still working. That's a forecasted saving of nearly £77,000 in just the first 11 years of retirement. The difference made to projected assets over that first 11 years is even more significant if we look at the assets comparison with around a £112,000 improvement shown. So if we go back to the cash flow chart and select year view, we can see what the projected numbers are estimated to be in each year. And if we move this slider to age 67, the state pensions obviously kick in that year at an inflation adjusted estimated amount. We can also see that we've extinguished Billy's ISA by then, but Millie still has £120,000 in hers. There's £305,000 in the bond, and each GIA still has a projected £39,000 in it. Pension-wise, Billy's has £492,000, and we've managed to preserve Millie's to an estimated £39,000 despite the withdrawals. If we go to the taxes section though and scroll down a bit here, we can see what the estimated tax bands and allowances would be at that time, with the assumption that they've increased a bit with inflation. Based on the projections, the state pensions would use up the majority of the personal allowances, so we haven't got those available for private pension withdrawals at that point, and we'd therefore look to increase the withdrawals from the bond. If we change this chart back to taxes then, and we went to the comparison chart, we can see that there is some tax projected in the new scenario, but still quite considerably less than what's expected in the base plan when just drawing from the pension. If we switch this back to cash flow chart view, we can then see from age 77, I've switched pension withdrawals back on again, but we'd make that judgment at the time based on what's available in other plans. There's no point trying to be too specific when you're planning a long time into the future, because the only thing we really know for sure is that the tax allowances, investment values, and probably tax rates themselves are going to be quite different to what we've projected. The purpose of modeling is just to give us a steer. We can't predict the future precisely. Just based on the changes made though, the taxes chart, if we quickly switch back to that, shows a reduction in tax across the entire timeline of around £218,000. Most significantly though, if we switch to the projected assets chart, the new scenario shows a forecasted improvement of about 664,000 over the timeline. That's a huge difference in the legacy you leave behind and really just underlines the difference that tax efficiency can make. Now it is important to say that pensions are still likely to produce the better growth result 
when you're accumulating money over the long term because of the tax relief they provide. That could either be extra money added into your pension or in your net pay, depending on how your contributions are made. But quite simply, you're unlikely to build up the same amount of money by foregoing pensions in favour of other investment wrappers. Like I said at the start, if you're interested in learning how to use this fantastic software yourself to assist with your own financial planning, you now can with my cash flow modelling courses, which you'll find a link to in the description below. If you've got a pension pot and you want to know how much income you can sustainably generate from it in retirement and the steps you can take to increase that income, watch this video next because I provide a full breakdown of that there. That's all for this video, folks. I hope that's been useful and I'll see you next time.